Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lauren Justice, Development Director at CTE. We hope you are staying safe and healthy. We're excited about the number of school districts, utilities, OEMs, bus dealers, and others from around North America participating in today's webinar. This is the first webinar of a three-part series that will recur on the first Thursday of the month in May and June. CTE conceived this series to showcase the three primary pillars that frame the electric school bus transition. Number one, the bus technology itself, which we'll speak to today. Number two, implications from the electric grid and supporting charging infrastructure, which we'll highlight on May 7th. And the third pillar, costs and funding. On June 4th, we'll review the advocacy work CTE and others are leading at the federal and state levels for policies that support electric school bus adoption. We'll also discuss current electric school bus programs and their creative funding strategies. Go ahead and mark your calendars for the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We will be sending you an invitation in the coming weeks. Today's speakers are Dan Rodeva, Executive Director of CTE, who will introduce our organization and the work that we do. CTE staff Eric Bigelow and Allison Wiley will then give a high-level overview of electric buses. Raymond Manalo with Twin Rivers Unified School District will follow with an in-depth look at best practices and lessons for successful electric school bus deployment. Then, We'll conclude with a question and answer session with the speakers. Please go ahead and locate the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions throughout the webinar. If we do not get to your question, do not fear. We will compile all questions with answers and distribute to attendees next week. With that, I'll pass it off to Dan Rodebach, CTE's Executive Director. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, well, welcome everybody. We, we, we've done a bunch of these webinars at CTE and I, we, we're usually at CTE all huddled in a conference room together sharing, sharing our screen. Uh, now we're spread out all over Atlanta working from home as I imagine all of you are. And so I hope uh, that, that you enjoy the next hour with us um, and hope you can learn a little bit about school buses and about CTE. I've got four slides. I'm gonna go over them pretty quickly because I wanna get to Raymond and Eric and Allison to talk a little bit about the technology itself. But I do wanna take the opportunity to just give you a insight into CTE, who we are and what we do. First and foremost, we're a 501c3 nonprofit engineering and planning firm. We do focus on our mission and our mission is written here. And I think the big point here from, from our mission is that that is what we focus on. We don't necessarily um, focus on how much money we're making um, because we don't make money. We have no profit margins. So we focus on our mission and really have just tried over the past 27 years to keep our doors open to move these technologies forward. Um, we have a $571 million por portfolio. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, but mostly it's doing research, demonstration, and deployment of clean transportation technologies. Um, we have a national pre presence with Atlanta, Berkeley, LA, and St. Paul offices. If you could change the slide. The next slide is a graphic that shows you uh, our zero emission bus projects across the country. Uh, there's two different dots on this map. One is our deployment projects, which are the green dots where we help transit agencies across the country deploy zero emission technology buses, mostly battery electric, a few, a few fuel cell buses as well. Um, and you also will see the yellow dots are ZE, zero emission bus planning projects. Uh, these are transit agencies across the country that have committed to convert their entire fleet to zero emission. And in order to do so, we help them with a strategic plan on how you would do that, which routes you would do first and what technologies you would use. Um, we are by far the industry leader in doing this work. Um, and as I mentioned before, as a nonprofit, I think a lot of the reason we are the industry leader is that we started first. We were in, there's a lot of engineering firms jumping into this field right now. But when it was a small market and not a lot of money to be made, CT was the only uh, organization out there doing this. Um, so uh, I think that's given us a bit of a head start. Uh, if you go ahead and switch the slide. Um, the head start's important because uh, what, we, what we do a lot of work with is route modeling, rate modeling, and uh, vehicle modeling to help deploy the buses. And as we deploy buses, we always go back and true up our models. So we, we've got, uh, of the data that's out there in the, in the transit bus market, we've got the preponderance of it at CTE to make sure that our modeling and that the work we do is accurate. 
Um, as an organization, we, we, are develop, we are divided into four different work areas. The first is the prototype development. And I won't get into much detail here, but I think the point that you need to know is that we don't just know how to operate these buses, but we, we know how to build them as well. Uh, we helped Bluebird with their first school bus in 1995. We built the first hybrid electric Humvee in 1994. Um, Proterra, if you, don't, if you don't know Proterra, Proterra is right now the market leader in the battery electric bus deployment on the transit side. We helped Proterra with their first bus in 2008 and in fact helped them deploy 22 of their first 38 and continue to help them along with New Flyer, Gillig, and BYD buses on the transit bus side. So uh, we, we do help with um, not just building the buses, but obviously we help transit agencies deploy the buses. We're industry leaders in the smart deployment area. And as I mentioned before, we do vehicle modeling, route modeling, and rate modeling. Um, we help with charging infrastructure design and deployment. Um, we also help transit agencies with the solicitations for zero emission buses, battery electric buses in particular. Um, you can't solicit them the way you typically would a diesel bus and that you can't just say you want your bus, a bus that'll do 140 miles because a battery electric bus uh, you can always get one that will do maybe 140, but will, what you have to know is will it do 140 on your particular route and your particular weather conditions and um, your particular duty cycle with your predict particular loading. So the way you do the solicitation is quite a bit different. And of course, contract oversight is important too, because typically the infrastructure, putting charging infrastructure in is the long pole in the tent. And you want to make sure contractually that you don't end up getting buses before your infrastructure is ready and can't operate them. And then lastly, under smart deployment, we help with key performance indicator reporting, which will go back to your board or to your management on how well the buses are doing and how close they're doing uh, compared to what we predicted that they would do. Uh, and then we mentioned before also fleet transition planning for those that are looking to convert their entire fleet. We do a, a set of analysis there to help you determine how many buses you would need. Because battery electric buses are not necessarily a drop-in replacement for diesel buses, um, uh, we take a look to make sure that uh, you can replace your entire service with the number of same number of buses or how many additional buses it would take to do the same amount of work you're doing now. We look at fueling options, which is typically charging options. We look at on-route charging. We look at depot charging. We look at a combination of the two. We look at inductive and conductive charging and help you determine how best to charge the buses. And of course, we do a life cycle cost analysis so you'll understand the complete cost because you are going to save a lot on operating costs with battery electric buses um, when compared to diesel. But the life cycle cost because of the initial uh, extra capital cost is a good thing to look at over the life of the bus. And last but, last but not least as an organization, we do a lot of education and outreach. Uh, there's three events that we've listed here. We do multiple events each year to bring the industry to together. Uh, the last of which, if you change the slide, is uh, our zero emission bus conference. This is the largest zero emission bus conference in the world. Um, we hold it every year. We had over 500 participants last year. We focus just on zero emission buses, battery electric and fuel cell buses. Uh, this year, we're expanding beyond transit into uh, a market that will include school buses and also uh, university bus operators as well. So uh, we, we welcome everybody there right now. I know with all that's happening in the world that uh, these conferences are being canceled right and left. We're still hopeful that by September, everything's back to normal and we will be, continue to hold this conference, but we certainly will have a special track just for school buses. So for those of you that are interested, we welcome you to attend that as well. So without further ado, I do want to bring in Allison Wiley. Um, Allison's gonna talk about the school buses themselves in particular. She'll also be working with Eric. Allison has uh, been working in this uh, arena for some time. Uh, we're very proud to say that we brought Allison on staff part-time at CTE. She's working out of Portland, Oregon, um, and she's helped in a large part put these, this series together. So, Allison, take it from here. Oh, thank you, Dan. So, why electric? Why now? Why would we electrify the school bus fleets when it's so much work? There's a lot of reasons. COVID-19 might slow this down. It'll slow down most things, but it will not stop it because there's a lot of momentum here. The prime driver is children's health. Children are the most vulnerable age group to toxic diesel emissions. The children who ride the bus are the most vulnerable of those children. And I think both red and blue states really get that. Other drivers here are reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, many states and cities have climate goals they take seriously. And there's also lower fuel and maintenance costs. Those vary. They depend on your region's cost of electricity, 
especially managing your charging. And we'll be covering that in our next webinar. Who went first? Who are the pioneers? It turns out to be a rural school district in Northern California, Kings Canyon. I talked with their fleet manager, Jason Flores, this week. I learned they ran four small buses, 14 to 18 passengers each, if you can believe it, just a 60 mile range back then in 2014. And Jason was honest with me, it was a really hard project. It had a lot of bugs. They didn't have the benefit of peer districts who could give them mutual support, who were also running electric school buses because they went first. They also didn't know that CTE was out here with electric bus expertise. And happily, this webinar is helping to solve the problem. Now people are learning that we, we can and do help with electric school bus deployments. Many people ask about bitterly cold climates, and that is a really common concern, and it should be. And so I interviewed Laura Peterson yesterday, and she, along with Mark Forbord, operate this electric school bus in a climate that stays at 10 degrees or below for days at a time. Um, they're very robust people. I really respect them. I said, how does it perform, your electric school bus, in those temperatures? And she said, very well. She said, we have never had to go out and rescue the bus from a breakdown. I said, do you keep it indoors or covered? And she said, no, it's out in the elements. And I asked, how are people responding? And she said, people love the electric school bus. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Eric Bigelow. Thanks, Allison. Uh, again, this is Eric Bigelow with the Center for Transportation and Environment. So uh, looking briefly at uh, the fuels selected out there for buses. So just trying to, you know, understand where things are today. Diesel is still the vast majority of uh, vehicles purchased in the market. Um, electric is making strides. And uh, as, as far as uh, fuels and future drive trends grow, uh, we do really believe uh, fully electric is going to be the future down the line. So uh, it's good to see that uh, picking up some steam. Uh, next slide, please. So on the, uh, as far as today, uh, North America, uh, by our count, there's about uh, 400 electric school buses out on the road uh, with California uh, leading there with around half of that. Um, Virginia has some well-publicized and uh, great goals to dramatically increase uh, the numbers of theirs on the road um, with hopefully just uh, 50 just in Virginia uh, by the end of 2020. Next slide. So uh, at this point forward, I'd like to talk a little bit more, get a little more specifically into some of the kind of unique and different parts about uh, electric versus uh, conventionally fueled vehicles. So looking uh, at just uh, thinking about the fuel source and how, how you refuel and power these vehicles. Um, starting with diesel as the uh, easy incumbent to, to start with. Uh, there's, there really are uh, a lot of great reasons to use diesel. It's a very convenient fuel. Um, it is easily stored. Uh, you can deliver a tremendous amount of energy in a single truckload. Uh, of course, the uh, challenge here is the pollution that diesel creates, both, uh, both from the greenhouse gas side as well as those criteria pollutants um, directly harmful to health. Uh, looking at uh, how the uh, diesel is measured, um, uh, it, it's uh, also very familiar units. Uh, diesel is measured in gallons. It's easy to purchase uh, and, you, and you pay for it by the gallon. Uh, contrasting that with electricity, um, electricity from the grid, very uh, difficult to store and really there's a few methods out there, um, but as far as the whole grid goes, it's relatively little stored to date though that is changing quickly. Uh, familiar delivery by wire uh, and dramatically lower pollution. Um, and better yet, as the grid gets cleaner and as more renewables are brought online, that uh, pollution and emissions associated with electricity production do continue to decrease. Looking at how uh, electricity is measured though is, is more challenging. Um, you do have to, un uh, get into uh, volts, amps, kilowatts, kilovolt amps, kilowatt hours, and how you pay for that can be by the kilowatt hour, uh, by your peak kilowatt hour usage, uh, depending on your service, potentially the voltage, 
and then uh, also t the time of day and uh, e even other th uh, interesting things out there as well like critical peak pricing events that can can also have a big impact um, so with that next slide so I guess if I if I can have a, a single takeaway out of this what I'd recommend or uh, f from the slide uh, understand and, and keep with you how how energy is measured and, and what the analog is so electrical energy is measured in kilowatt hours and the best thing to think of that is an is an analog with uh, kilowatt hours as gallons of diesel um, both of them measure the energy on the vehicle. Both of them measure are consumed by the drivetrain uh, in order to move the vehicle forward. Uh, yeah. um, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Webinars from home. Sorry about that. All right. And uh, so, what I'd like to uh, focus on now is the batteries. Uh, so the key components that make up uh, zero emission vehicles and uh, specifically electric school buses have been around for a while. Um, and why I think we're, we're hearing a lot more about these today is the availability of high capacity, modern and lower cost batteries. Uh, and that is really what's, is what's making uh, this dramatic transition possible. Um, next slide. So uh, we already spoke a bit about uh, the measurement of energy. Again, that is kilowatt hours. Uh, and it, the analog there to conventional fuels is gallons of diesel. Um, uh, the other key unit you'll see, and it's, it's important to keep this distinction uh, separate and understand the difference is kilowatts. Uh, it, it, they are frequently used interchangeably and, and they are uh, measuring very different things, kilowatts being a measure of uh, power. And the way to think about that is, is horsepower. So um, just as a, a gallon of diesel and horsepower for your engine measure very different things, uh, kilowatts and kilowatt hours also measure very different things. So uh, important to keep those distinct and um, at least have, uh, you know, make sure someone involved in your purchasing process can uh, keep track and understand the distinctions there. Next slide. Looking at uh, batteries themselves. So the, as, as purchased, uh, vehicles are sold with a, a particular size battery. Uh, internally, we, uh, we've, we've called this at CT the nameplate capacity and the 200, um, uh, if for instance, if you have a vehicle that is advertised as a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, there is indeed uh, 200 kilowatt hours in that battery pack. Uh, however, as, a, as an end user operator, uh, you don't necessarily get to use all of that 200. Next slide. Looking at a realistic view on a new battery, uh, the top 10, roughly 10% is typically reserved. Um, and your charging for your vehicle will stop roughly 10% from full. Uh, this is to uh, try and allow that ex expensive battery as part of your overall vehicle to last as long as possible. Uh, it's using charging all the way to the very top does increase that capacity you get to use. It does also cost in terms of life uh, for the battery. Uh, on the bottom end of the battery, you have about 10%, roughly speaking, that is also difficult to access. Uh, this is also uh, for longevity as well. Um, using the very, very bottom of the battery pack is also uh, more detrimental to its overall life. And uh, once the battery gets really low, it does also start to uh, impact performance and eventually to where a system performance can be reduced. Next slide. One primary difference between a uh, 
thinking conceptually about a battery and a diesel tank, both as energy carriers, is it's, it's completely normal uh, for a battery pack to lose capacity as it ages. Um, and that is, is very unfamiliar in the conventionally fueled world to have your energy storage system decrease in capacity over time. Um, so starting with that same 200 uh, rated 200 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, using what's often uh, termed the, the end of life state after this battery has lost about 20% of its capacity, that gets to um, 128 kilowatt hours usable. Next slide. So uh, what, what does cause this battery aging? Uh, short answer is, is just about everything. So uh, using the battery, not using the battery, uh, how long it's been used. Uh, there are certainly higher impact um, and more uh, dramatic ways that do impact the battery lifetime. Um, so that's something to work with the manufacturer. This can vary a bit by specific battery chemistry. Um, but again, the, the real takeaway is that battery aging is, is kind of a normal function of batteries themselves. Next slide. Uh, also, we get a lot of questions about future batteries. Um, so the good news is battery technology does get better year over year just with existing uh, manufacturing improvements. Um, the main thing to know is, is if you hear about a, a future battery that is, is going to change the world and uh, read an article about it, uh, there is, to, there is a, a, a long engineering and development cycle between uh, something working in a lab uh, scaling up manufacturing uh, and having vehicle manufacturers roll that in. So this is something that is going to con consistently get better. Um, and there's also, uh, for the benefit of the zero emission uh, transportation and uh, electricity users of the world, a dramatic worldwide research effort going on right now. Um, so certainly a, a big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for whoever can make the best batteries. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also get a lot of questions about safety. So um, as a, just to say very succinctly, any energy storage system that has enough power to move a bus can lead to a hazard in the wrong conditions. So um, with that, really the, the battery management system on a vehicle is the, is the linchpin that does keep all that safe. And uh, on the whole, they really are very safe. Next slide. Um, so looking at new, uh, what, what is new in bus systems? Um, the many systems will be similar. Um, a few are going to be unique. So they're listed here, but primarily uh, uh, heating and air conditioning, uh, engine driven accessories are now electrified, uh, the, the drivetrain as well as the charging interface. Next slide. So briefly looking at the electric drivetrain, uh, this consists of a battery pack which feeds the motor controller, sometimes called the motor inverter, which uh, translates the electricity from the battery pack into something usable by the motor, uh, and then feeds that into the motor. And after that, it's uh, from the motor on out, a pretty uh, conventional, typically a pretty conventional powertrain with uh, suspension, differential, and, and brakes. Next slide. Uh, so how, how can CT be involved in this? Um, as a nonprofit, uh, as Dan mentioned, we're uh, an independent third-party information source. Um, and we were successful when zero emission deployments are successful. And we want to do um, the, the upfront work and, and the follow-through work that helps support the, the quickest implementation of that successful zero emission future. Um, in the el in el in electric school bus deployments, that can be assisting on uh, making sure the best technology is chosen and making sure that it's put under uh, realistic and good, um, uh, uh, good scenarios and uh, also looking at larger fleets and how they can transition. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to transition over to uh, next slide. Uh, thank you and uh, hand this off to uh, Raymond Manalo with the uh, uh, Twin Rivers Unified School District. 
Thank you, Eric. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Raymond Manalo. I am the fleet manager, vehicle maintenance manager for Twin Rivers Unified School District. Uh, next slide, please. So Twin Rivers is um, the school district that covers 127 square miles, and we're located just north of downtown Sacramento. Uh, the district serves about 27,000 students at 61 sites. Uh, we are a Title I district. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, our transportation department transports about 5,000 students over 794, uh, so, sorry, 749 routes, and we operate approximately 90 school buses each day. Uh, we used a tiered routing system to be able to cover this many routes. Uh, we have a diverse fleet that includes many manufacturers and types of buses. Our department, with the exception of four gasoline buses, uses alternative fuels for the remainder of our remainder of our fleet, including uh, renewable diesel. Sorry. We committed about a year ago. Oh, oh, please. Uh, we committed about a year ago to actively pursue replacements of not only our school bus fleet, but our, our, our entire district fleet with electric vehicles. Uh, our goal then was to have half of our bus fleet be electric within five years. We received our first bus uh, in Lyon in December of 2016, and we have grown substantially since then. Uh, as you can see, we now have 30 buses, electric buses uh, in our fleet, and we have at least five more expected delivery before the end of our school year, uh, June 30th. Next time. So what makes us successful? Um, really, the, the key things are that we initially in our pilot project uh, identified the stakeholders, uh, we looked at feasibility, and then looked for funding sources. Next slide. So, who are the stakeholders? Well, some of our stakeholders, uh, and should be part, part of your plan as well, include your fleet manager, uh, your router who does the, the bus routes, uh, our facilities department, some sort of energy specialist, whether that comes from your power provider or an electrician, uh, the utility company and your bus manufacturer, and possibly a project manager. You will need buy-in from the group as well as your board of directors. Next slide, please. So is your plan feasible? How many buses do you plan to deploy? Do you have a goal in mind for future for the future of your fleet? Um, think long-term, what does the next five to 10 years look like for your fleet? Uh, identify things, where you're gonna put everything, um, things such as your transformers and your EVSEs, your um, basically your chargers for Layman's terms, if you will. Uh, this photo here that you can see was taken before we started the project. Uh, we had to revamp part of our yard to accommodate the electric uh, buses, and we are still doing that as we bring more of them into our fleet. Uh, think about the amount of power you currently have. If you're not sure, definitely start talking with your utility provider. Uh, and think about what are some of the costs that are associated with a project like this and where do you get funding from? Next slide. So where did we get funding and where can you get funding? Uh, our initial deployment was a pilot project funded from the California Air Resources Board through our local air district, the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. Uh, we've also received funding for additional buses from the California Energy Commission and the Hybrid Vehicle Incentive Program. Uh, we've also submitted applications to several other funding sources. Our local air district has been very help helpful with sourcing available funds. Also, talk with your bus manufacturer as well. Many of them have grant writers on staff to help you apply for funding. Next slide, please. 
So function and optimal operations. This is where the work comes in. Next slide. For our, our initial project, we followed three basic steps. We ordered vehicles and the EVSEs. Uh, we did trenching and pipe and wire were next. Then our utility provider, SMUD, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, did a power upgrade and installed a new transformer. And then finally, after clearing some hurdles, we were able to get the equipment installed. Uh, you can see in the photo there, some of the work being done. Uh, the bottom right corner is our new transformer and switch cabinet. Next slide, please. Uh, remember that this is a group effort. Partnering with the groups I mentioned as stakeholders is key. Uh, you all have goals to accomplish. This is going to be one of the steps that will be the most important for your future plans. If you create a good foundation here, your end result could be huge. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to highlight the infrastructure because this is one of the critical areas. Some points to note are to make sure that you select the right EVSE for your long-term plan. The landscape of EF EVSEs has changed since we first started. Another point is to is charge management. Uh, the gray EVSEs on the left are quote unquote dumb chargers, uh, meaning that they cannot collect energy use data specifically from each EVSE. Uh, they work really well, but they were purpose built for a specific application. Uh, one other thing is to future proof your project. Uh, think about where you want to be and plan for that. Trench anywhere you might want EVSEs while you have everything disrupted. Uh, you can run pipe and wire and then add the EVSE later down the road. Uh, this is one of the key hurdles that we had to overcome. Uh, we ordered our equipment and our vehicles at roughly the same time. And our vehicles came in faster than our infrastructure was completed. So it caused some delays in actual deploying the buses. Next slide, please. Uh, make sure you have a plan for training of department staff. These are some of the staff areas we had to consider. I think technicians and the drivers are the most important. The technicians need to know what they can and cannot work on. Uh, and then work with your bus manufacturer to provide training. Re we require this from our vendors as part of the purchase contract. Specify it in your vehicle bid process. Uh, the drivers are also critical because they can make or break your cost per mile. The proper driving technique is going to make sure that you can get the most amount of miles out of whatever battery size you choose. Next slide. Uh, think about management software to be able to, to do managed charging and, and in-depth data collection. You will want this information to calculate your cost per mile and justify your plan. How do you charge? When do you charge? Um, it was mentioned before about cost rates and time of use. All of those things are going to be key components into managed charging. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some basic cost savings. We've estimated a savings of about 80% in fuel and 75% in maintenance costs. Now, one thing that, we, that I wanna point out is that some of our buses have over 20,000 miles on the original tires with about 50% tread remaining. They also have about 50% remaining brake life. This will add up over the life of the vehicle compared to your equivalent diesel. Uh, your fuel costs and electric costs are all gonna be interchangeable with your total cost per mile. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the cost savings of your electric fleet, um, that fleet can generate 
revenue as well. You can collect and sell carbon credits to offset the energy costs. Uh, another area is vehicle to grid power sharing. Uh, your utility can help you with this. The utility companies are really trying to push um, electric vehicles, the possible battery storage, the reserve of battery storage for them can be huge. Uh, I've heard that there are some companies out there that are funding your project from the power pole to the EVSC. So they'll pay for everything to get you to use an electric. So that could be huge in funding your, your project. Uh, the LCFS is what you wanna research to get and sell the carbon credits that you will be generating. Next slide, please. Uh, after all your planning and work is done and you're ready to deploy your new fleet, remember to involve your community. Make a big deal with your students. Get the media involved to help you promote it. Do something to make this project stand out. Uh, we provided some of our students with t-shirts that were provided by one of our vendors. Uh, you also noticed in previous slides that there are some decals on our buses and our EVSEs. Uh, this tells people that we partnered with sources that they know. You know, everybody in this area knows their utility provider. We are promoting that provider and the fact that we partnered with them. Uh, we have several links to articles and videos on our website if you're interested. Uh, remember, you are doing this to help your kids and your community. Uh, Allison mentioned earlier that this is a great benefit for the students. Uh, but also consider the drivers and your technicians in the shop. There are huge benefits besides just cost savings to your techs, to your drivers, uh, any staff that are in your department or area. And number one is the healthy kids. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, our experience has been good. We had to alter our plan along the way, and that's okay. Uh, face the challenge and grow from your experience. Uh, don't be afraid to take the plunge into electric, and don't be afraid to reach out for help. Uh, with so many new technologies out there, you can find what is right for you. Nothing is one size fits all. What works for me may not necessarily work for you we can all do something to help promote the electric school bus. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you to CTE for having me today. Thank you so much, Raymond. This is Allison. Um, Raymond, your experience is so valuable to all of us. I'm going to go ahead and have our panelists take questions. First question that came in, might be a good one for Eric, is how are the battery electric buses themselves heated during cold weather? Sure, so with, um, uh, in, I think similar to um, conventionally fueled buses, you can have a diesel, uh, a diesel or other conventionally uh, fuel fired heater uh, be available to heat the buses, um, so that's, uh, is that, you know, I know some, some folks do think that is a, uh, uh, maybe perhaps missing the point on a zero emission transition, but is, uh, it's, it's done in the transit world and it is, it's done in the school bus world as well. It's a, it takes a, a lot of energy to keep a school bus warm. And then Eric, a little bit related to that, I think you mentioned earlier that the grid is getting cleaner over time. Can you speak to that briefly? <laughs> Yeah, so as uh, over the last um, certainly decade, but uh, I think both uh, over the last decade, there's been a number of uh, coal-fired power plants retired. There's also been a tremendous growth in renewable energy production. Uh, both of those trends are projected to uh, increase in the future. So uh, every, every electric vehicle that's put on the road today typically is going to continue to 
uh, effectively get cleaner as time goes on, as we have more renewable energy online uh, and uh, fewer of the worst sources, which are typically the oldest coal plants. Oh, thank you. That was helpful. Um, this question might be a good one for Dan. Um, an attendee says it stated the pollution from producing batteries will decrease the more these units are on the road. Can you expand on that? I, I, think, I think that that's the, the question that, that um, Eric just answered, and it's, it's the grid that actually is fueling the batteries. Uh, if, you count the, if you assume the fact that the, the energy for the battery bus is coming off the grid, the grid is, is decreasing uh, in emissions over time because of all the reasons Eric mentioned. Uh, actually producing the batteries, um, you know, I don't know if, how much that is going to decrease over time uh, because uh, other than just volume, more volume would mean uh, maybe you're more efficiently producing them. But I think that this, that's a question that's just referencing the grid. Oh, good. Thank unless, you. I'm, unless I'm missing something. I think that's good. Got some questions for Raymond. Um, did you get grants and funding assistance from the relevant utility with upgrading the power infrastructure? Yeah, our utility provider actually uh, helped us close the gap between what was funded from the Air District to uh, our contribution. Um, they were really excited about being able to partner in um, and kind of expedited some of their internal processes to allow us to move the project forward faster. But yes, they actually contributed dollar amount um, to us to be able to get this project going. Good. And do you collect telematics trip data on your buses? Key performance indicators? Yeah, we, we actually <laughs> use a um, complete routing system. Uh, it plots and automatically routes our buses using optimal performance, um, optimal range. And we try to follow that with GPS and then use that data to help us with coming out with our cost per mile in the end. That's helpful. I'm seeing also I've got questions over in chat. Um, what's your estimate of maintenance cost savings? I know it varies all the time, but we're also wondering what does Smudge charge you for electricity? So first we we kind of calculated really roughly a 75% savings in maintenance. And the way I got to that was in California, we have uh, the highway patrol mandates that we inspect the bus every 45 days. Uh, so that remains the same. It doesn't matter what type of bus or the type of fuel that's used. So that remains the same with electric. There's no change there. Um, the 75% savings comes in the lack of oil change, the air filter for the engine, the fuel filter, and the transmission service, because none of those things exist. So if you take just those areas right off of the top, compared with the equivalent diesel, uh, there's that 75% savings that we talked about earlier. Uh, and then as you progress along, we find out that there are, are potentially other cost savings. Uh, for example, in our fuel, we based our savings, uh, our initial savings on what it cost us to purchase a gallon of fuel, not what it cost us to actually put that gallon into a bus. Meaning there's all kinds of overhead costs related to fueling uh, that we're not calculated in that savings. The same with maintenance, you know, we remove the oil and filter out of that, but that savings didn't calculate what it costs us to dispose of that used oil or that used filter. So if you get into the overhead costs and the back end charges, your savings can get uh, much larger, much quicker. Uh, and then for the cost, we pay roughly, um, I think right now we're at nine cents a kilowatt hour, which equates out to about 17 cents a mile uh, when we actually put that bus on the road. Good to know. In a different vein, what steps, Raymond, have you taken to educate the community, the first responders, mechanics, police departments? What have those conversations sounded like? 
Well, so like I mentioned in my presentation, we spec the training of our technicians into our bid process. So part of, you know, when we say we want this, you know, this item and that item, at the end, we actually require our dealerships or, or bus vendors, manufacturers, to provide training to our technicians, really no matter what fuel source we're using. Um, but the, the overall, the bus is the same as its diesel, gasoline, CNG counterpart. It's really just a bus. Um, the drivetrain is what really makes the difference. And because there's so much less moving parts, and they're so easy to work on right now, um, it's kind of a, a no-brainer. Uh, as far as first responders, we actually brought our um, some of our first responders to the yard. We showed them around to touch and look at the electric buses uh, so that they know what they're dealing with when they get there. A key thing to that is, is if you noticed in the pictures, our wheels and bumpers are blue. We selected that color to be different than every other uh, vehicle that's in our fleet so that our responders know right away that they're dealing with high voltage electric. That's good. Yeah. Do you ever assume that you're going to have battery replacement? What, what are your assumptions around cost of battery replacement? Do they last for the whole life of the bus or what are your thoughts on that? Well, so that's kind of dependent on where you're at. A traditional bus, the national average, uh, for a school bus anyway, is about 12 years. Uh, in California, it's closer to 20 years. So if you kind of do a, a forecasted cost per mile, total cost of ownership, uh, we foresee the break-even point between the, the electric at a higher capital cost than the diesel at about the, the 10 to 12 year mark. Uh, so for us in California, the remaining eight to 10 years is basically free, right? <clears throat> um, as, as far as the, mm, I'm trying to best think of how to, word this. Um, the, the battery should, you know, all intents is that the battery is going to last eight to 10 years. Um, I just kind of look at it as in that, depending on the bus, of course, in that 10 year mark, I'm probably looking at an engine replacement uh, and or a transmission replacement. Um, plus, you have to add in, you know, some of the other items, like I mentioned, we're looking at doubling possibly tripling the life of a tire. Uh, when you add up total cost of ownership, they, they kind of pencil out. You know, so yes, there's, they're much more expensive to begin with, but the cost savings over the life of the vehicle is, is going to end up comparative to a diesel. Okay, good. In terms of workforce, did you have to readjust the number of people working in bus maintenance? Naturally, people are always worried about job losses. And what are you experiencing in that arena, Raymond? We haven't made any adjustments uh, at this time. Um, I don't foresee us making any, any changes unless our fleet gets larger. Um, you know, for us, we have a lot of technology in our buses. We're looking at GPS, uh, camera systems, student tracking, all of those items. And right now, those are on a repair situation where if they're broken, then we fix them. Uh, where they really need to be on a preventative maintenance schedule like we're accustomed to with every other item on a, a traditional bus. So I, I foresee as we progress down, there's gonna be less mechanical work, uh, but more preventative maintenance and more quote unquote, if you will, electronic repair. Uh, so I don't see the workforce diminishing any. It's just gonna be an evolution of what they're accustomed to working on. Okay, that's good to know. And then did you have to, here's the question. Did the reduced range on the electric school bus affect any of your routing decisions or can all the buses go out on pretty much all the routes? 
Our average route is only about 60 miles. Um, so we can currently fill all of our routes with an electric bus. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot about you know, doing trips and things like that, where for us, it's becoming more cost effective to contract out field trips, long distance trips to your traditional um, charter bus service and do them internally. We're focusing more on the actual student transportation and getting the students to and from school. So for us, every route that we have will be accommodated by an electric bus. As the ranges get higher, we might be able to start doing field trips as well, you know, as long as we're staying in the local area. Okay. It, just to clarify from an earlier question, did you say that your all-in cost of electricity is about nine cents per kilowatt hour? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Are you doing bi-directional charging? We are not yet. We're actually working with Lion Bus and our utility SMUD uh, to do bi-directional charging. The latest buses that we have received are um, able to do bi-directional. Uh, we have some chargers coming in, EVSCs coming in that will be capable of doing bi-directional. And so we're working with SMUD now to do a pilot project around that. Good. Yeah, but bi-directional is, I think, very much a part of the future with vehicle to grid, but it's not here yet. Okay, one more thing. We're going to have to wrap up Q&A here. Not all manufacturers use fuel heaters. This might be for Eric. Not all manufacturers use fuel heaters on an electric school bus. They address heating differently to accommodate cold weather temperatures. Eric, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, so I think um, the this comes back to, uh, and I'd agree, not, not all, not all uh, large electric vehicles are going to have some sort of fuel-fired heater, and this will depend both on the climate um, and on the requirements and a little bit perhaps the flexibility. Um, the challenge of heating up a really large vehicle with a, with a lot of surface area uh, when you don't have a diesel engine um, in order to use that uh, leftover heat from the inefficiency of a diesel uh, and, and get that free heat does require just a lot of energy. So if that needs to come out of the battery pack, uh, it does have a more dramatic impact on range. So, so it certainly is possible to have um, uh, a heating system that doesn't require that. Um, so it really depends on uh, kind of acceptable variability of range uh, and certainly the climate. So that'll vary place to place. Oh, thank you, Eric. I think that that is probably all the questions that we can do in this moment. We are happy to do a write-up. In fact, I think I'm in charge of that write-up that can follow. And of course, we're posting um, those things along with the slides in the recording. And let's turn it back over. Is it Dan? Yep, it's Dan. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just wrap up. Uh, as Allison mentioned, first off, thanks everybody for attending. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. We see that we've got a lot of questions that we did not answer. Um, we, I, I think we're able to write down answers to all of these or nearly all of these, and then we will share them with everybody that registered for the event. So you should get answers to these. I think the one that threw me off a little bit was some battery plant that's killed all the plant life within three miles of its manufacturer. Um, not sure where I saw that or who sent that in, but if you, I'm at dan at ct.tv. If you can maybe send me some reference on that, I'd love to look that up. George Shea, um, I'd love to look that up um, and learn a little bit more about that because that's something that's certainly new to us. But other than that, I, I think that we can address all of the questions and get that out to everybody. In addition, and I think we answered a couple of these online, uh, we will send out a, um, a recording of this um, webinar to everybody that attended and we will send out all the slides. So you should have all the information that you've heard and seen today, uh, you should receive tomorrow. And then I'm not gonna promise we'll have answers to the questions tomorrow, but we should next week get answers to all the questions. And as we mentioned earlier, this is one of three webinars we're gonna get into details on charging um, and uh, inter interfacing with utility in the second one. And then of course on the third one, we're gonna be talking about funding options and what's happening both in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. 
that's going to help make this transition to uh, battery electric vehicles easier for all of us. So thanks for your time today, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again at the next webinar.